Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Manny Pelias. I am your city councilman for District 8. It is a pleasure to come um, to you in your homes or in your offices or wherever it is you're watching us uh, with some really important information, information that is going to impact every San Antonian um, for years to come. And uh, to uh, my right, uh, your left, I've got uh, Rudy Garza, our new CEO of um, uh, CPS Energy. Rudy, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Um, actually, I should say thank you for letting me be in your beautiful, Absolutely. You know, in this beautiful thank conference. Thank you for being here. And making yourself available. Welcome. And we've got Mr. Kuczynski, the CFO of this organization, CPS Energy. And um, you're, we're going to be doing a lot of number talking, and uh, I hear you're good at math. That's the rumor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, listen, you know, uh, gentlemen, we're talking about um, a request that you have made of city council, uh, a, a pretty serious one, uh, for a rate increase of 3.85%. Uh, and this is a rate increase uh, on everybody's bill in San Antonio. Um, and so, you know, Rudy, as the CEO, and Corey, as the, uh, as the CFO, uh, People have been asking all city council members why and what is it that led up to this and why why now and and is it really necessary and um, you know why am I hearing about this for the first time right and uh, well, you know why that number and you know what's wrong over at CPS to where you need this right and those are those are questions that are um, legitimate and we've been getting them nonstop and I know that you've been getting them too so. So, Rudy, the first question to you, why are you making a request now? Um, and tell us, you know, what it is that you guys are facing. Well, Councilman, number one, I appreciate uh, you inviting us to participate in uh, this town hall this evening. Uh, we have been doing a series of town halls across uh, all districts with the city of San Antonio because this is a serious uh, request. Uh, you know, the the. The reason, you know, the, the way the process works uh, when, you know, we have a job to do for our community and uh, in serving electric and gas utility service uh, to San Antonio and in the, the, in the Bear County region. And when we look at our financials uh, and we've been, you know, it's been eight years, quite frankly, since we've been to city council for a request of this nature. Uh, over that time frame, we have uh, been as efficient as we can be. We've cut close to $900 million. Uh, out of our uh, cost structure to try uh, to make our, our financials work over the last three years in particular. Uh, we've seen a tightening of our, our, our financials uh, in terms of the revenue. And, and the way I would explain it is we're paying today's prices um, for what it costs to serve our community, but we're, co we're covering le yesterday's, you know, uh, rates. So, you know, we, we're paying uh, we're recovering 70 cents on the dollar, give or take, just, just if you just factor in inflation alone, you know, what we're recovering is 70 cents on the dollar of what we're paying in today's prices to serve our community. And, uh, and that just, you know, that, that drives our need. You know, we started at, at a higher percentage, uh, because, you know, we, we don't come in very frequently. So we're looking at a 10 year horizon for what we thought we were going to need to invest. Uh, and we spent a lot of time with city staff, uh, Ben Gorzell and Eric Walsh, uh, to, to, to really pare it down to the things we know we're going to have to spend money on over the next couple of years with the recognition that we're going to have to come to the city uh, more frequently uh, to, to, to look at, um, you know, at, at what our financial structure looks like and, and make adjustments as we go. But uh, if you just factor in the inflation, you, you compound on that, the exponential growth, the change in technology uh, and all the things that impact our business. Uh, the, the, the time is now, you know, we are, uh, we're requesting, you know, the, the increase we're requesting will raise us $73 million uh, a year, which on the grand scheme of things in a $2.9 billion budget, mm -hmm. right? It's a very, very small part, but it, but it is, it is targeted direct investment in our capability to serve our customers and we also need to deal with the fuel costs we've paid up to now uh, that uh, about $418 million that we're talking about spreading over 25 years. So uh, it's timely. It's not every easy councilman. I know that it's a difficult vote for you. Uh, and I appreciate the challenging questions you have asked us in the three uh, B session 
uh, sessions that we've had up to this point, and I'm sure Thursday will be a, a challenging conversation it, as well. It has been. The, the entire time we've been discussing this, uh, we have been getting uh, objections and protests from, from every corner of San Antonio. And, you know, you, you mentioned the word inflation. Corey, um, you know, inflation's a real, very real thing. Uh, it doesn't require you to be the CFO of a multi-billion dollar utility to know what that what that word really means. And for the people at home, inflation means, you know, that gallon of milk costs more today than it did yesterday. And I'm just only getting a gallon out of this, you know. Uh, what does it mean for you guys? What is what, how does that inflation play out? Because part of Rudy's answer was, look, we also are are facing inflationary pressures. Yeah, absolutely. A few points. We track our rates in Texas because we have seen this like this about forty percent for the last since nineteen eighty. Uh, tracking the low inflation changes. Right. From our perspective, which we think helps us, it's our inputs. It's the raw materials. So All that's in the labor of contracting. So, you're just so there's a lot of inputs to our business that we're paying at today's price. Said, um, and the key reason that we were able to avoid is paying out nine hundred million dollars of the last few months. Okay, that has helped us tremendously to not pass on this information to our customers. Um, but we're said, I mean we're. That bones and the us technology that's under 20 it's for just getting staffing all these backups uh, reasonable levels and it's about the customers about the quality of service do we take forever to set up you know customers how long we put up not long we yeah and, and so uh, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what I'm hearing, and I think what the folks at home are hearing, is that CPS Energy is not just a company that delivers electrons to your house so that your light can turn on. You guys are a company that has billions of dollars in assets and infrastructure in the form of, you know, poles, copper wires, you know, tons and tons of plastic, yeah. cement, rebar, right? Yes, and then all that equipment, like very, very much like our homes. They um, require continuous maintenance, right? And then on top of that, you've got million point five people that you're serving yes, just sir. in San Antonio, and all of them sometimes call you, and you need to have call centers, That's and, right. you know, all these operations. So when you say, Rudy, that you've shaved down nine hundred million, what does that mean in concrete terms for folks? Like, what is like? Can you give us an example of what it is that you know you've had to do without? Because well, of that shape. Yes, sir. So over the last two, you know, like I said, the last three years have been, have been, uh, if, you know, uh, especially tight. Yeah. So when, when we see our financials getting tight, then we go into the pandemic and we know that that's a horrible time to ask for rate increasing. We're still kind of there, although the economy's opened back up again, we're still feeling the effects of the pandemic and, and we recognize that. Um, but, but one of the things you do is you start, you start cutting back on, uh, hires that you think you can you know, kind of manage. So you you continue trying to hire as many linemen as you as you can because you got to have linemen to run the system. But you stop hiring engineers. You stop hiring analysts. You start hiring fo other folks that you need that are also important. Um, and so, but you're still losing people. We lose 50 to 100 employees to retirement at CPS Energy every year. We will lose 100 people this year. And part of this request. <clears throat> is really to start chipping away at the 400 people we are down. I can't run a utility. I can't provide service if I don't have people, you know, in those seats doing those jobs. And even if we start and hire 250 people, which we think is probably about the capacity we can hire over, and that's actually what, you know, Ben and the city put in the rate case. They think we can hire 250 people uh, a year. We're still going to be losing 100. So we're going to, it's going to take us years to get caught up just based on the natural attrition that we have. So, so those are some examples, you know, when, when we get into a financial bind, you stop doing some pretty basic things that when we get to the bone, the bone is we're not hiring anymore. We put it in a hiring freeze and we've been in a hiring freeze now for two years. Yeah. And, and so 
and again, you know, in, in, uh, in my day job, I'm an attorney and I represent a lot of small businesses, and large businesses, what I'm hearing from every single one of them from convenience stores to restaurants, to multi-billion dollar companies is labor is not getting any cheaper. Mm -hmm. Right. And neither is, you know, paper and toner for the printer and, uh, neither is pretty much anything. And most of my clients have the luxury of increasing prices and adjusting their prices on the fly in response to, you know, market conditions of what it is that they need to do or the costs that they need to face in order to do their business. But you guys are reliant on city council to approve a rate increase to match those yes. costs. And you haven't done it for how many years? Eight years now. Why, why wait so long? Well, there are windows of opportunity to come in and talk to the city about um, what our need is now if it was an you know absolute emergency where you know, you know we had to come in we you know we'd come in when, when we needed to but you know we try to time it. it you can't do a rate increase in the summer that's when the bills are highest right you really don't want to do a rate increase while council members are are running for re-election that's just a you know politically it doesn't make any you know sense so you've really got windows you know um you know kind of every fall where it might be a good time to come in you know, for a rate increase. And so, you know, we, we've kind of, you know, tightened our belts to the extent we can, you know, when we've missed a window or maybe, you know, we've had something happen that year that, that allowed us to, you know, to push it off another year or two. And we've been able to just manage our finances over the last eight years, you know, to, to be able to avoid it. But again, the last three years in particular, we would have come in probably that fall before the pandemic came, came along. But we saw that what was happening, we knew that ultimately that was going to impact San Antonio. And, uh, and my predecessor, you know, made the decision that, hey, right now is not the right time. Okay, that, that, that's fair. And, um, and so I, I do want to make sure that folks understand. I'm, I'm looking at my phone from time to time because the questions that are coming in are from you. Uh, and so here's some questions. We, we've heard about this rate advisory committee. Um, what, Corey, what is this rate advisory committee? How is it different than the board? Um, you know, the rate advisory committee gave some advice. The board did something, you know, this week, and then, uh, how does all that work? Good question. Is, is this mic working here? Okay. So the rate advisory committee, it's new. We set it up this summer. Um, and, and you know, it's an initiative by our board of trustees. Um, they, they are, uh, a, com a committee that will give us input, but they, they don't officially make decisions like our board. So ultimately they will give recommendations to the board of trustees. Um, they, they are stood up to look at rate design, uh, talk about generation planning, how that impacts rates. What we did, just for, for context, we spent all summer long with them, um, kind of giving a, an education, so to speak, of uh, how our rates are made, what goes into the, kind of the, the nuts and bolts of it. What we asked them to do the last couple of months was look into this rate request. Now, we asked this of the Assistance Advisory Committee as well, which right. has been around for 25 years, and we, we asked both of them, Ultimately, for their recommendation for for the rate request, um, and so they uh, provided their uh, their the recommendations to our board of trustees, which they took into consideration on Monday when they ultimately decided to vote for for our request. Now, th this rate advisory committee, um, who are they? I, mean, I know the answer, but uh, who are they? It, it, the it's not just some consultants and subject matter experts oh, no. that we brought in. I mean, these are they're San Antonians. Yeah, they're San Antonians. And okay. You know, they're either um, appointed, it's split up, there's 20 folks, um, some are appointed by our board of trustees, and then by city council as well, and, right. and each council member has their own representatives. So it's made up of folks just with very diverse backgrounds, different um, professional backgrounds, and, and the dialogue is, um, it's pretty robust, I and mean, Rudy and I have been in all these, and I'm sure Rudy's got some, some yeah. thoughts on that too. Yeah. I mean, there, there are former CEOs of major corporations on there, uh, Reed Williams, who's our chair, uh, former city councilman and, and got a lot of experience in uh, the policy arena. We've got environmental advocates on there who, who are doing a great job. We've got community advocates who are involved in, you know, planning commission work and all kinds of uh, other service to our community. Um, so we got small business owners, you know, we've got, you know, homemakers who stay at home and take care of their families. And so we've got a lot of, uh, we've really got about as diverse and all, and vocal, I will say, that um, the rate advisory committee and the CAC and all the other committees that give us feedback, um, it isn't easy feedback. It is challenging feedback. They are critical of the things that they see that they think we we can do better, uh, and and the feedback is very valuable. Rudy, what what was the recommendation from from the uh, 
I'm sorry, the rate advisory committee. Was it just, hey, Rudy, uh, ask for more, you know, ask for more money on the rate? I mean, because I, I understand that they, you, you got multiple. Yeah. Um, well, comments from that. yeah, so uh, there were a lot of statements that were, you know, made uh, during that time uh, of folks who were frustrated. They're frustrated about winter storm Uri. They're frustrated because they think the management team needs to do a better job. They're, you know, frustrated for all kinds of reasons. And and I, you know, completely, you know, empathize with, um, you know, the perspectives that they shared. Uh, they wasn't unanimous. I, you know, we did get a 12-6 vote. Two folks abstained who felt like uh, they they didn't have enough information or they just didn't want uh, to to vote on on this case. They thought maybe it was too you know it was too soon uh, for them to to make a decision. But the but the ones who voted for it, uh, the members of the RAC who voted for it, voted for it because they recognized number one, it's been eight years, and number two, that what we were asking for uh, you know really uh, uh, defines how we serve our customers. And so on that basis alone, those who supported it. Uh, you know, voted for it. We got a unanimous vote of support for the uh, for the uh, creation of the regulatory asset to deal with the fuel because everybody yeah. knows there's some you know pretty negative consequences for for the city of San Antonio and for us if we don't deal with that uh, by the end of January. Um, but but on the on the rate increase, those who voted against it really voted against it be, because you know they were just kind of frustrated with you know um, our performance and you know. And, and a lot of it was management team related, uh, you know, I can tell you our management team has gone through. I know we're going to talk about that a little bit, yeah, yeah. but, but a lot of it was management related. Um, and, uh, you know, and we got to work through that. So, so look, you're, you're asking for 3.85% um, increase to people's bills. Corey, assuming city council approves that, how does CPS use that money specifically what will you guys be doing with the additional 3.85 percent if you get a yes from city council yeah absolutely great question and so there are kind of four buckets of of uh, money or four buckets that we will spend the money in um the, the first one that's probably most interesting to customers is is under the umbrella of infrastructure resiliency but it is a type of investment that our customers want to know that we are protecting ourselves in extreme weather events so this is for Continued investment in freeze protection right. and for, for our power plants for cold weather. Um, it's continued investment in um, the technology for communicating to our customers about events. You know, as one of the criticisms was, we, we weren't getting to our customers, you know, in advance and during. So, continued investments there. Um, in terms of managing outages, when ERCOT tells us we have to shed load for San Antonio, and, and which means we got to have some rolling outages, well, that's the underpinning that is a lot of technology. And so there's continued investments that we can make in that technology. So a lot of the money, 31 million of that 73 um, will be invested in that type of investment. Um, technology is the other bucket of money. I talked about how we have some really old kind of technology that is, supports our billing, our back office, our website, things like that, that's over 20 years old. And if you think about us using technology 20 years ago, I mean, playing like Oregon Trail, I mean, that's the type of technology that um, we're looking to upgrade over the next five years, really. So this is kind of the beginning of that investment. Uh, and then Rudy mentioned growth. I mean, a portion, about 14 million of that 73 is going towards supporting the fast growth that we're seeing in the community. The last two years have been some of the fastest growth in new customers that we have we have seen. And then lastly, Rudy talked about people. Um, absolutely, right? We have dollars going towards ensuring that we can fill the 400 vacant positions that we have. Um, part of that is actually raising our minimum wage uh, to eighteen dollars as well. Um, that's part of the request. So those are the the, the four buckets that we're going to contribute spend to, and ultimately, not only is that the things we're getting for, but that's also helping CPS Energy maintain strong financial metrics, which, um, as a customer, we care about because that allows the utility to to borrow affordably, which means lower rates. And we all have a vested interest in a, a healthy CPS Energy, which correspondingly leads to a healthy city. Um, and, and, and manages both, you know, affordable rates and taxes and things of that nature. Yeah. So, so Rudy, um, here's 1 question that I, I imagine you must hear a lot. And that is, why don't we just sell CPS and, uh, or why don't we invite 4 or 5 other companies here to compete with CPS or what is this deal where we've got this exclusive contract with CPS? And to me, um, that that is coming loud and clear as, um. You know, genuine merited questions that make perfect logical sense being asked by people who have not yet understood or haven't ever been informed 
like of how CPS exists, what kind of creature it is, and what is it you guys do, and and uh, and why are why is CPS different than other utilities? So uh, I have worked at uh, at two other places, you know, uh, the utility pro- company and private sector up in the Dallas Fort Worth area, and you know when I was down in Corpus Christi, we owned a gas utility and you know water utility and other you know utilities down there. So I've got perspective uh, from other types of business models. Uh, what I can tell you about the municipal utility business model is that um, the influence that our policymakers here locally have on uh, the way CPS Energy provides service, the you know the responsiveness to our community, uh, you know it is completely different in a municipally owned utility environment like CPS Energy. You know we are by, we're owned by our community. You know I know that there have been you know uh, challenges with. The, you know, us being, you know, maybe not being as transparent as the communities wanted us to be, you know, uh, maybe not being as responsive, but at the end of the day, council has influence, you know, our, you know, our board is made up of board members, not from New York city or, you know, or wherever, you know, investors are, they're made up by citizens right here in San Antonio that uh, work and, you know, and, and, and have to live here. So, um, so, so the, the, the community's ability to, to provide input and feedback into the, the things that we're doing in the direction of the company and the, the $330 million on average a year we send back to the city of San Antonio helps ensure that you're not having to vote on tax increases right. every year. The growth of San Antonio benefits the city of San Antonio just by the revenue that you're bringing in for, from the growth, but our, rev, our revenue grows too. To, you know, as the city grows and that benefits, you know, the city of San Antonio. So if you were to sell the city, you know, the, the CPS energy asset, and that's what we are, we're a community asset. What that means is you're going to get the benefit of whatever that influx of cash is going to be, but you're going to have less influence over outcomes going forward. And what I know about this community, we have a very activist society in San Antonio that has opinions and wants us to hear them. And we are working really, really hard uh, to do that, but I promise you, I have been in a in a in a, a, a private sector utility. The responsiveness and their willingness to act on things the community is asking them to do is a lot different. And I will add that the the safety net that we have here in San Antonio for our lowest income customers, the the sixty percent of our customers that are at some level of the federal poverty guideline does not exist in the private sector. Oh, those folks are left to go at it alone. And 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 in San Antonio, our assistance programs are so more much more robust than what you're going to find in the private sector. You know, when when I first got to San Antonio, one of my teachers in school gave us it as an assignment. You know, write an essay on CPS and um, and the, your, the water utility saws, and then come back and report and tell me what you know what that company is. And I, I like a lot of San Antonians, thought. Oh, it's just a company that sells us energy, but I, I learned and, and I was, I was uh, pleasantly surprised that it's not, it's a company that San Antonio owns yes, sir. and that the profits go to San Antonio. Whereas if we were owned by some no name group of investors out of New York, and they're always in New York. I love my people from New York, but I like teasing. Them. I love New York. <laughs> um, but, but if we were owned by, let's say some private, you know, conglomerate out of New York, all those profits would leave San Antonio and we would never see them again. Right? Yes, sir. And then the miracle is, is that somehow the people of San Antonio have figured out how to run this amazing, huge organization called CPS to to profit from it. And then that money goes and forms one third of the city's budget. And we use it to play for streets and sidewalks and police and parks and all these, all these fantastic things. And so in my report, and you tell me if I'm wrong, because this was 20, you know, this was almost 30 years ago. I said, if it weren't for this structure, San Antonio would charge much higher taxes or provide fewer services. That's right. Is is that still true? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I, you know, I was uh, I worked inside City Hall down in Corpus Christi, which is where I'm originally from, uh, for five years between my private sector experience. And coming to CPS Energy, and I can promise you that my community, my hometown, would love to have an asset like CPS Energy that creates the flexibility for San Antonio that most most municipalities, most uh, uh, communities do not enjoy 
the benefit of that influx of revenue that, you know, some, most of them it's property taxes, sales taxes, and whatever other revenue they're able to bring in. Um, so San Antonio is, is, is positioned well in owning what is the largest municipally owned electric and gas utility in the country. Okay. So because we San Antonians, everybody who's watching this is a, is an owner of this company. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll first point out parenthetically that it always amazes it amazes me that you guys are a are a company that tries to convince people to use less of its product. I've never seen a company out there saying, "Hey, you know what? This fizzy soda that we make, please drink less of it." Right? And instead, you're always pushing to people use more of it. But no, you guys are actually working really hard. And you have entire an army of people here out there educating neighbors and giving them resources on how to use less and spend less. Why? Well, a couple of reasons. Spending less, I mean, the customers using less of our product. And I've got, you know, we've got a board member, you know, one of our board members is pretty critical of that program because, yeah. again, I mean, we're in the business to sell. You know, that's how we earn revenue. But for the community, the, the great thing about municipally owned power and, and gas is we, we, we have a long-term play. We're thinking not, you know, quarterly profits, you know, councilman. We're thinking the next five, ten years, right? And so for us... Um, you know, for by by encouraging our customers to use less of our product, that's deferring future investment that we might have to make in another power plant. Uh, and, and for low income customers of ours, which we're constantly thinking about how we can you know uh, uh, better serve them, it's all there's also some utility burden relief in there. If we can go in and weatherize a customer's home. Uh, and save them anywhere from 15 to 30 percent on their on their usage. That means their bills are lower. That helps with that utility burden uh, issue that 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 we face here in San Antonio, quite frankly. So, um, so those efficiency programs aren't just about really they're not about the revenue we're losing. It's how are we saving our customers money long term by not building that next power plant and helping those that who are most in need in our community. Okay. Well then shifting gears here. And for those of you that just tuned in, I'm, I'm a city councilman, Manny Pelias. I'm here with the CEO uh, of CPS energy, Rudy Garza. And I'm here with Corey Kaczynski, their uh, chief financial officer, Corey. How, how will this rate increase if approved look like on people's monthly bill? Like what, what is it they're going to see? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. And it's one of the, the key questions we get. So what we've shown in our presentations is what the view looks like for an average usage of residential electric and gas customer. Okay. And there are two parts of this rate request that we've talked about. There's the base rate component at 3.85%. Uh, that was about 73 million. And then Rudy mentioned the, the winter storm fuel costs that we have paid um, and our recommendations to spread that out over time. When you add those two parts together, Councilman, that is about $5.10 per month extra for customers on their bill. Um, now, that is for customers who do not qualify for the affordability discount program. Part of what we're looking to do uh, through this program is to uh, offset the base rate for customers who income qualify for that. So the current discount's about $12.10. If you qualify, it's gonna go up to about $16.14 for those customers. So prospectively, we're trying to offset that component. Now, the second thing we're doing is expanding that program through this recommendation by adding about 14,000 customers uh, to it. So our enrollment could go up to 65,000 customers. We recognize there are a lot more customers probably in the city uh, that um, could qualify that we don't have the net large enough yet. So as part of this proposal, we want to do that. So the last thing I say too is not everyone's the average user, right? And it may be different during the winter or summer season. So if you have access to go online at cpsenergy.com slash rate case, we actually have a bill estimator on there, which is new for us this year. And it's for both residential customers and commercial customers. So you can go to one of your bills and put in your, your usage data and get a, a kind of a unique look at what that bill impact So, so let like. me get this straight. Right now I can go to your website, cpsenergy.com. Yes. Slash rate case. Slash rate case. Yes. And then in there I can enter my information and it'll print out uh, the hypothetical future bill so that I can see how this will impact me. Yes. I don't know if we print it, but it's definitely going to be on the screen okay. for you to see it. All right. Yeah. And then what I'm hearing you say is that this 3.85% rate increase request is accompanied by um, you know, assurances and, and an effort to get more people signed up to your affordability program, which basically means if people are out there just are, are in dire straits and feeling really economically vulnerable right now, and they qualify for this program, they can sign up and get discounts. 
Absolutely. And you're talking about signing up tens of thousands of San Antonians. Okay. All right. That, that's yeah. that's that's interesting. I wouldn't well, be having this conversation with a privately owned CEO. That's right. Right. Yes, sir. And, and let me add. Um, I want to thank you and the rest of City Council. Uh, during you know uh, we don't get federal. You know I get I get this question a lot. Why can't you go to the federal government, state right. government, and get funding? There's no funding for utilities at the federal, state level. We have one place to go for funding, and that is our customers. At the end of the day, uh, but the city of San Antonio does get funding. From the federal government recently, we got some funding through the ARPA program through through the ARPA program at the federal level or the city did. Uh, they took 20 million dollars of that and they set it aside. They said, we're going to commit this money to help with utility assistance. So, on top of the programs that we already offer our customers, if you are a customer and you're behind on your bill, we have, uh, you know, 20 million dollars that we think will help to about 20,000 of our customers get caught up. Mm -hmm. So, if you're, you know. Uh, if you, you know, and for, and if you're eligible for our affordability discount, it's, it, it would, it would really wipe out whatever your balance is, no matter how high and allow you to get, you know, kind of get a fresh start. Uh, and, and again, I think we're going to be able to help uh, uh, roughly around 20,000 customers with that $20 million. So councilman, you know, I appreciate the, the gesture uh, by the city and the ARPA funding that you received uh, to make utility uh, assistance for our customers a priority in, in that allocation. Yeah, that was actually uh, a culmination of a lot of work. All of city council got together. We looked at the problem, right? Which is that people just weren't able to meet their rent uh, obligations or utility obligations. Uh, myself, the mayor and, and uh, you know, the city manager, we repeatedly went to DC and, and made the case that San Antonio needed to have its tax dollars returned to it, right? Yes. Uh, so that we can invest it in utility assistance and rent assistance and 20 million dollars is a lot of money that we brought home that's a uh, and I, I i consider that a big win for the most vulnerable people of san antonio now pe speaking of people of san antonio we did get an online question from a from a gentleman named bill he's asking does the rate increase apply only to the energy charge or does it also apply to peak capacity charge fuel adjustment charge and the regulatory adjustment Corey, teeing it up yeah, very good. So you will see the the increase on your your energy and the and the fuel. You won't see the increase on the regulatory component of your bill. So those are kind of the the key parts. Um, you'll see a slight increase on the service availability charge as well. Um, but when, when you net it all together, it's still going to come to an additional five dollars and ten cents. But those are the different component parts that you'll see uh, see it. In fact, this is a great ask. We should probably get a sample bill um, and and share that with you so we can kind of point out. What it looks like online. Talk a little bit about the customers. I mean, yeah. the commercial customers, because on the commercial side, you know, their base rates include multiple components, and and all of those are adjusted. So, talk a little bit about uh, about what that looks like, Corey. Yeah. So, the commercial customers are going to see um, a, a slightly larger bill impact than our residential customers, but they have things like demand charges, for instance. Um, residential customers don't have that. Um, that's a different billing component, um, and so um, our commercial customers. We'll see a similar you know, rate increase. In fact, we have slides that show all the different customer groups and then what that bill impact is, and um, we can probably share that with with you as well. But maybe we can get both examples out there to show where those impacts, um, depending if you're a business or a residential customer, what it looks like. So base rate, fuel, both impacted, regulatory, not. Right. So that's how you get to kind of the on the three point three percent, you know, total bill impact. Is there's a component not being impacted, which still you know, uh, uh, shows up that 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 brings it down to about that 3.3% on average. So we got another question from Gerpas. Um, thanks for the questions, guys. Keep them coming. How does the cost of electricity and natural gas for a CPS residential customer compare with the cost for residential customers in Austin, Dallas, Houston, and other parts of the state? Is that something you guys look at, Rudy? Yes, absolutely. We look at it all the time. Okay. It's a great question. In fact, it's great to think of this answer in the context of the beginning part of this conversation about um, how much uh, revenue we provide to the city and all the stuff we do for our customers. We do all of that and we still have the most affordable electric and gas rates in all of in all of Texas. Um, it's on average about when you you got to benchmark the how the PUC does it from a usage perspective, but we are about 150 152 dollars uh, from a electric and gas perspective. Typically, it's Austin and San Antonio that have the lowest combined bills in the state of Texas. And so what that tells you about the business model is, how is it that the two municipally owned business models are pulling off the lowest combined electric and gas rates consistently in the state of Texas? Well, there's something special about the business model. 
um, and we track that all the time. So um, we have charts and uh, we'll show all the other cities and they're different. But what's also in our bill that, that, that we have um, that other utilities that have higher bills don't um, is this investment in, in to our, our, our customer programs where you give back that you don't see that's so we're doing that extra stuff and still providing affordable rates. Our investments in um, you know renewable, we're leaders in, in solar and wind, um, and we put more dollars towards that than, than some of the other cities. And yet we still are coming to the table with more affordable rates. And even with this rate request, um, you know we have uh, a lot of other utilities increasing rates as a result of the winter storm URI. Um, with our rate request, we still anticipate being in, in the, the one of the most affordable um, in all of the state of Texas because our bill impacts aren't going up as much as these other surrounding, I'd say not just in the state, but around, I'm sorry, in Texas, but the surrounding states still had impacts as well um, from Winter Storm Mary. So I guess long and short, I get pretty passionate about it, but I think it's a fantastic story um, for folks to realize how competitive we've been. And for those that still are feeling the pressure, we have a lot of programs to still even offset that as best we can, and to your point, we're looking to expand them through this rate request um, going forward. So th that, that was a lot to unpack, right? But here's here's the answer to your question, Kirpus, and that is that San Antonio, you heard it here, San Antonio is more competitive um, and more affordable than the other big cities in, in Texas. And that's it's not an accident. I mean, that's by design, right? And so, and speaking of affordability, we did get another question, which is, hey, I, I liked all these, this talk of affordability programs, how do I sign up? Like, where do people go? So there's a few ways you can sign up. The easiest way to sign up is to call 210-353-2222. Okay. Our energy advisors are, you know, ready to take calls uh, to to uh, get you on a pro affordability program that works for you. We've got multiple programs. I'm on what you call a budget billing program. So every month, uh, my, you know, they look at my history on average of what I use. And I get a bill that's the same every month, so I can budget to that. But you know, for those who uh, uh, who are income qualified, you got to be 125 percent of the federal poverty guideline. Um, then you're eligible for our, our ADP, our uh, affordability discount program. And we're increasing that the amount of people that are eligible for that program by 14,000 as part of this rate increase. And we're increasing uh, the discount. But there are other programs if. If you're on a heart monitor or dialysis machine or you got some medical equipment in your home, call us and we can put you on critical care on our critical care customer program so that we know that you've got some going on at the house that we need, need to pay attention to. All we need is a little form signed by your doctor uh, that validates that and we'll get you on that program. We've got an energy angels program. If I wanted to pay a portion of your energy bill, you know, because I know you're having something going on with your life that you need help, I can you know, call up our customers and say, hey, uh, can can you please apply a couple hundred bucks to Manny Felias's, uh, you know, account? I'd like to help, you know, a friend of mine in need. And, and most people, and we get a lot of folks who do that, don't want any credit. They don't want the folks to know. They just do it. Um, you know, SAISD Foundation is, act I, I was a, a, on the board of SAISD Foundation. They do that for kids all over, you know, the school district who, the, who, know, who they know need help. Um, so there are a ton of programs out there. 210-353-2222, and uh, our folks can can, uh, and, can get you. Can get my, my team's monitoring the social media feed here, and they're going to include that number uh, a few times uh, throughout our conversation. So um, here's another good question we just got from uh, Nanette. Why can't you guys just use disaster relief funds to cover the cost, uh, you know, and instead of asking for a rate hike? Well, I will I will say two things. We did apply for some disaster relief funds, and we were – turned down by the federal government. So we went after those funds, but as you can imagine, uh, with so URI, the, the, the need far outweighed the available dollars. And we did go to the state legislature when, when all this happened in February. We saw a billion dollars worth of fuel expenses in one week. That is, under normal conditions, that's what we spend in fuel for the whole year. We believe that that's illegal, unconscionable. We're fighting a good majority of those costs you know, in the courts. Um, but we went to the legislature, we worked with our state our state uh, delegation, and we said, look, you know, can the legislature consider an appropriation to help, you know, offset some of the impact that we know is coming for our customers? And un unfortunately, uh, the legislature didn't ask either. So, you know, Councilman, we tried. Yeah, and, and so I, I need to stop here and make emphasis and put an exclamation mark on something that you just said. A billion dollars over just a matter of days is what CPS Energy had to incur 
right, in order to keep the lights on for just those few days. What the heck? How is that? What happened? I mean, I know that this was in response to that, that Arctic storm, but a billion dollars? What is, what'd you spend that on? <laughs> Great question. Um, so, so for clarity, the billion dollars is what we were charged, but we haven't paid, haven't paid full, it yet. Right, okay. right. We've only paid 418. We're disputing that 587. Uh, but the two thirds of that um, are related to the cost of natural gas. So, so I know the answer, right? So I'm obviously I'm asking you answers. I know the, 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 the I'm asking you questions that I know the answers to. And so let me let me help along here. When you say related to natural gas that you had to go out on the spot market, that means that when the storm was at its worst. You guys went out to suppliers and said, all right, guys, we need some extra gas here. Send it our way. And they said, what? We're going to sell it to you for instead of two and a half dollars or $3 per unit. I'm going to sell it to you for 150, 200, 300, as high as $400 per unit in the middle of that storm. So instead of paying $2 and 50 cents, like I was doing at the beginning of February, I was subsequently you know, five, six days later, paying $400 per year. How is that not it's, illegal? Like well, gouging you? How is that not gouging? Well, so I'll give you a, an analogy. The La Quinta down at Brooks. Yeah. Here in San Antonio went from like, you know, it's 80 bucks a, a night to 150 bucks a night. And when, they got indicted. And they got indicted by That's the right. attorney general. For, for um, You know, how that can be illegal and us getting charged, you know, thousands of percent. You know, above, you know, scarcity pricing exists when markets get 15,000 you know, 15, percent is not reasonable. Uh, you know, we had we had some suppliers who were able to restrain themselves, uh, but there were a lot of suppliers who, you know, cranked it up. You know, we believe uh, and, and it, at the national level, uh, there have been investigations by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission that have said, hey, look, it looks an awful lot, lot to us like like market manipulation. Those are the types of arguments that we're making in the courts right now, because we just believe that, you know, to be in a reliability crisis where, you know, our customers were, you know, dark in their homes without power and me and really being in a catch 22, we had to pump as much gas as we possibly could into our power plants to try to keep them running and bring us out of this event. So you had a declared that disaster by the governor of the state of Texas, by the U S president, but at the same time, markets were allowed to just, you know, run amok. We believe that that's un inappropriate. And you file lawsuits about it, and you're probably yes, going to end up in front of the Texas Supreme Court duking this out. Soon. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so, you know, we're, we're obviously we've transitioned now to talk about this storm, uh, you know, and we've got a question from Jan on Facebook. Why am I paying 5 to $8 more per month now to cover this winter storm is that what this 3.85 percent is going to go to to cover the winter storm damages no sir the the okay. base rate increase uh of three of the you know three dollars three point eight five percent that's for op that's for normal operations we have not passed one dollar of the storm costs on yet um that we've held in account um that were above and beyond what we would have normally paid um you know um, because we were trying to be thoughtful about it one dollar and 26 cents a month is what we're talking about uh, asking our customers to pay over the next 25 years. Uh, other utilities pass it right along. You saw um, uh, stories of you know $15,000 you know monthly bills for that one week uh, that that you know uh, providers in the retail market uh, were sending to their customers. We're not going to do that. If we passed it through like we normally would, you know, normal fuel cost, customers would have seen a thousand dollars a month you know increase in their bill for the next. 12 months to, for us to fully recover that back. We can't do that to our customers. That's just right. not reasonable. Right. So what we're asking for here is a reasonable approach. It keeps that cost low. Is it 25 years long? Of course it's long. We could do it in 15 and maybe that dollar 26 is, you know, three or four bucks a month. But uh, for customers who are least afford, who are least able to pay, we thought that dollar and 26 cents was reasonable. As our system grows, uh, more customers will come in and help pay that cost down the road. And maybe that 25 years is something less over the next 10 years as, as our as our system can, continues to grow. So, Jan, the answer to your question is no, right? This 3.85% is not going to be going to cover, you know, the big uh, gut punch sustained by CPS because of the storm and because of the gouging. However, the 3.85% will go towards preparing us um, in a way that we can avoid the pain felt 
during that storm, right? And so this, you had said it earlier, this 3.85% is going to go towards resiliency programs. What does that mean, resiliency? Yeah, absolutely. So resiliency is how fast you can bounce back from, from an event like this. So, you know, we talk about reliability and resiliency. It's best to have both, <clears throat> both, right? So that, that's what resiliency is, is the ability to bounce back from these events. And what we've learned is there's more extreme, you know, events generally happening. So it makes sense that everyone's hardening their, you know, their infrastructure to be able to bounce back quickly so that you're not out for a while. Well, and how, the, how, how this has impacted our system, in the past, we're preparing for a summer peak. You know, in Texas, our plants are, are, are engineered and built to get heat out of them during the summertime, you know, so our equipment runs safely, so our our, our employees can you know manage operate our plants safely. Um, now that we have to worry about a winter peak like what we saw in February, what we end up doing is building temporary structures, putting temporary you know heating elements out on the plant, you know paying attention to certain equipment that we don't want to freeze. So you build all that temporary structure up to to really create a housing for some of those uh, vulnerable areas. And then once the winter's over, guess what you do? You tear that back down again so that you can get heat out of the plant. So um, so we believe that there are going to be some significant standard changes at the public uh, that come out of the Public Utility Commission uh, over the over the coming years, uh, and that may be you know a, a, an investment up to maybe two hundred million dollars that we'll have to make over the next five years. So what we're asking for now gets us through the next couple of years. Uh, the next time we come to council, we'll have a clear picture of what the future looks like, and then we can talk about what the what the and those are compliance related. That's work we have to do. So if I have to spend $31 million that I don't have today on power plants because I'm required to, <laughs> that means we got to do less of tree trimming, less preventive maintenance on our system to make that work. So, you know, as we were having the conversation um, regarding the response to URI and how and whether or not that's tied to this, um, you know, rate request, we did get a, a, a message from uh, a gentleman who says, um, what, what have you done to secure additional natural gas? And what has CPS done to increase capacity for more electric generation? Uh, there's two ways that we do that. We certainly have contracted for additional natural gas for this winter season. What we've also done is increased our storage capacity, you know, pretty significantly. And not only the storage capacity that, that, that we have access to, but the amount of gas we can pull out uh, during those times has also increased. We've also used financial hedges. You know, we, we, we all, we, we've always hedged against the price of, of the commodity <clears throat> to ensure that we're not overexposed to the volatility of, uh, of those type of markets. We've done more of that this year. Our hedging activity costs our customers money, so there's a balance. Could we hedge 100% of our you know, exposure? Sure we could, but there's some balance in there that is affordable for our customers and gives us additional protection. And we've done more of both the physical hedging and the more supply that we have and the financial hedging that, that Corey's team does a really good job of, of managing for us uh, to, 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 to make sure we're better prepared this winter. All right, shifting gears now. And this is where I'm going to start asking some uncomfortable questions, right? So this entire time I've been setting tempo uh, and tenor here, right? And uh, here's the first one. Jenny Yashimoto and others online have been asking, well, what's the future of spruce, uh, you know, our coal plants and uh, our plan to maintain San Antonio's goal of uh, reduction in greenhouses by, you know, a certain year? So let me start by saying the city... Uh, has been a leader, and CPS Energy has been involved in those discussions on passing the Climate Action and Adaptation Plan. That plan in and of itself, by us supporting that, requires us to take action uh, on, on uh, Spruce 1 in particular because there's about $150, $150 million worth of environmental uh, upgrades we'd have to make by 2028 uh, to keep that plant running. We know that's going to be a difficult thing to ask our community to consider and you know maybe the economics on coal have changed with the price of natural gas so low so i think uh, our board is going to get put on the path over the next you know probably six to twelve months at at, uh, at the latest i think it'll be sooner uh, than that to make some decisions on our spruce units uh you know the likelihood is we would close spruce you know one down within between now and 2028 uh, and make some decisions about the future of spruce two the the that there's a lot of life left in that spruce two unit 
um, where it makes sense to consider uh, converting that to natural gas. We can do that for right around $58 million uh, uh, conversion cost. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're going, we're, we're bullish on renewables and we have been. There is a sweet spot for us to be in that allows us to invest in renewables and still be, uh, you know, a reliable utility. You know, so when the renewables aren't there, whether we convert Spruce 2 to natural gas, we go out and buy another ga natural gas plant, maybe we contract with the third party to provide natural gas generation, or we buy it on the open market. When renewables aren't there and we don't have enough firm, firm generation to, to replace it with, when we go to the market to, to buy that, that power at whatever cost, guess what that's going to be? It's going to be natural gas. So we can either make a decision to responsibly uh, invest in what we know is going to be natural gas uh, uh, resource, or we can, you know, we can we leave it up to the whims of the market and buy it on the on the open market. Yeah, and again, the whims of the market is what's got us in in uh, you know a pretty serious bind. And Corey, you know, a lot of people come to City Council and they say, Councilman, can't you just order them to close Spruce Two and Spruce One and um, and or why doesn't Rudy just decide? Right. So first of all, Rudy can't decide to, you know, divest himself of a, you know, multi, multi million dollar asset. Um, you would need board approval, right? The board <laughs> is the only entity right. that has the authority to make that decision because of the financial implications long term of what that means. Um, now, I do think we can get the board the information they need with community input to make that decision over the next 12 months. I've committed that to council in multiple sessions. I will, I will say it again here today. Our council will make this decision over the next 12 months, but it has to be from a big picture standpoint. We got to look at our entire generation plan and, and decide what we want that mix to be. And, and as part of that, we will make the call on Spruce 2, but the board, our board of trustees has to make that call. Yeah, and, and, and Corey, and I imagine when you present that to the board, there's a conversation about math. At the end of the day, the math has to pencil out. And so what is, in very simple terms, what does the math look like if you close one of these plants sooner than later? And, and um, how does that keep you up at night? Because I know it does. Yeah, it does. And, and you're right, it can get very complicated. But I think if you stick with just the concept, right, the concept is you have this asset and it makes money for, for the CPS energy. Okay. So if you take it off early, it's no longer bringing money in. The second thing you got to think about is, okay, how did I build this asset? Did I use cash or debt? Well, for both Spruce 1 and Spruce 2, we still have outstanding debt. So initially when you build this, you time out, okay, but I'm going to borrow the debt for this long and I'm going to use this asset for this long. So it matches. So when you break that and you decide to close something early, what do you do with the existing debt that's still outstanding? And between Spruce 1 and Spruce 2, there's still about a billion dollars in outstanding debt. Um, a billion. A billion. Okay. Now, you know, the I don't know, over two thirds of it's associated with Spruce Two. So, you know, closing Spruce One isn't as financially impactful necessarily. But those will be the types of considerations we take to our board when we're mapping it out, saying, okay, if this is what we want, here are the costs of the replacement generation. Plus, here's still the cost of paying, you know, paying down this debt over whatever time. Let me, and let me just anybody who's interested in this topic. Go to cpsenergy.com, go to the search bar, and type in uh, resource plan, and you will get all the information that, that you're interested in as to the current assets of CPS Energy, you know, how much of each type of fuel uh, generation do we own, you know, and all the financials that Corey just talked about are out on the website on this topic. All right. I promised you uncomfortable questions. That was the first one, all right? It's going to get a little more uncomfortable, and forgive me. Uh, for that discomfort, but, you know, the public's asking and we owe them an answer. So, you know, following the winter storm, there were notable departures of top leadership um, and, uh, you know, here at CPS. And after, after, before, and during those departures, we started to hear an uproar of distrust from the public and um, the relationship of trust um, is clearly brittle right now. And so... How do you, what do you tell my neighbors and your neighbors who are currently expressing that trust in the face of this rate request? What I would tell, you know, my neighbors and friends and family that, you know, live in San Antonio and call me on a regular basis when their streetlight uh, is out. Um, 
I would tell them that, you know, the team that we have here at CPS Energy, young talent, you know, uh, extremely talented people like Corey Kaczynski uh, and others, um, the team that's here, we can win with. You know, we can't control what somebody leaving uh, for, you know, another opportunity. We can't control somebody making the decision that, you know, um, that, that, you know, they're going to look at the environment, you know, that we're in and, and opt, opt themselves out. I can tell you that uh, we are moving in a really, really positive direction culture-wise. Uh, my leadership team are working really well together. They're working hard uh, to uh, help us get in a better position with the community in terms of how the community sees us. Um, but I, I got to play the game with the players on the field, you know, Councilman, and I can't worry about those who have left. We have a, a very robust succession planning process here at CPS Energy that has prepared leaders like Corey and others who've stepped up over the last six to, you know, nine months uh, to, you know, fill roles. And there are others behind them that we're preparing. Um, you know, I got to pay attention, and I know this is a always a topic of interest, but, but we got to revamp our compensation plan at CPS Energy to ensure that we can afford the best and, bright, and brightest. You know, we, we, we shouldn't settle at CPS Energy. We're too good of a community. We're, you know, uh, we talk about, high paying jobs that we want for our community. CPS Energy is one of those places, just by the very nature of our industry. We're in the energy industry where you have engineers and you know operators and people who have high, high technical talent. And it's not, you know, I can't just afford, choose to whatever the dollar figure is that, that I think I can afford to pay them. I'm competing with Pernalis and I'm competing with AEP and I'm competing with Centerpoint over in Houston and all the other utilities around us for the same talent. I lost a VP here recently uh, to, to Perk Dallas Electric that paid them an exponential amount of salary more and gave them access to two bonus programs. I know bonus programs here at CPS Energy have been controversial. We have agreed that we're gonna, you know, we're gonna do away with our EIP uh, uh, program going forward, but I gotta pay what it takes to get people to choose CPS Energy over other options, that is a reality. And, and our employees, including our executive team, work hard to serve this community. And I just wanna reiterate that, you know, right now I'm doing as much recruitment of keeping people from choosing to, to leave CPS Energy as I am trying to get people to choose CPS Energy as a place of a business. And, and so, you know, I mentioned this distrust and I, I don't think you and I have already talked about this in the past and, um, and, and we had a very frank conversation about this and, and I asked you, you know, you know that these folks are angry um, and you know that there is a, that there's a trust crisis right now with um, the public and the utility and, and you said, yeah, I, I, I know that's true. Um, and I, I just need to make sure that people hear you say it. You understand why, right? I mean, it's not like they're crazy, right? I understand, Councilman. I mean, again, I understand the, the tone of the media stories that have been written. Yes. We've had folks, you know, quite frankly, we've had some folks that needed to leave the organization that have left. You know, the, the article on, you know, outrageous spending. I don't, I don't ever, you know, when I go to lunch with a colleague or, a, you know, I'm out in the community on business, I'm paying for that lunch out of my own pocket. Yeah, that really hacked me off. I know it did, but, yeah. but that isn't indicative of the culture of CPS Energy. Corey, when's the last time, you know, you used your corporate car to pay for lunch? I don't know. Ever, right? And so, so what I'm saying, you know, Councilman, is, you know, while there certainly are opportunities for criticism, and I get it, I get the mistrust, that is not indicative. There are good people. For everybody that I know knows somebody or has a family member, that works at CPS you Energy. 3,000 people? 3,000 people. The uniform. And they are fantastic. Yeah. They do the job every day. They leave their families, you know, when it's cold and when it's rainy and when it's hot outside and during extreme weather. And they come to work in the weekends and the nights and holidays to make sure that we get the power back on. And we you said something people. that I read in the media. You said something fascinating to me that really rung a bell. And you said, look, if I'm going to repair this trust relationship, right, that, that is admittedly damaged how do you expect me to do that with 20 year old equipment that is not going to get an upgrade if we don't get this investment right so that that was poignant sir I, I can't i mean i can't improve service levels and you know and, and not ask for more resources you know again the, the what we're asking for here you know is you know in my mind a a, a, a modest reasonable 
you know, ask of the community um, to, to put their trust in CPS Energy to get back where we need to be. We were, you know, our, our service levels, our customer satisfaction levels were off the chart before, you know, February came around. Right. Our customers are hurt with us more than anything. They're not so upset that our cotton, you know, was asking us to, to, to shed load. The way we said it, they were upset about. The fact that they were out for days, and they should be upset. We get that. But we also have to move forward and make sure that in the future, those things don't happen again. And I can't ensure that if I don't have the investment from the community that it's going to take to make sure that we're paying attention to, to making those improvements. And the way I've described that anger is that, you know, in February, people were scared. And they have a reason to be scared. But the one thing about Texans is you scare them. Once they get over that, they'll be pissed. Uh, and <laughs> right. And everybody is right now and everybody remembers viscerally what it felt like to be cold and scared and not have answers. And, and, um, and that anger is, is legitimate. Now, Corey, I, I, I met with your boss a few days ago and I, I told him, I'm going to ask this question. And he hesitated and he looked me in the eye and he says, look, if I give you the answer to that question, it's gonna sound like I'm making a threat and I don't want it to come across as a threat, but I think the answer is really important. And the question is as follows. What happens if city council says no to this rate increase? What are the concrete consequences? Because I think we owe the people who are watching the, the truth. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's a good question. So start with, I mean, the consequences are severe. I believe that. Severe, and, okay. Yeah, and, and, and I'll spell them out. You know, Number one, it starts with the customer, and and as Rudy pointed out, without this incremental funding, it directly impacts our service levels uh, to our customers. Um, that's point one. Point two is, um, without that influx of, of seventy three million dollars, that impacts our financial metrics. Right, that's just another way of thinking. How healthy are you? You go to the doctor, you get physical, and you get some metrics back and say, okay, I'm in good health. I'm not good health. Right. For us, that's what financial metrics are, and. If we don't get that, we'll go to the doctor, i.e. our rating agencies, and they'll say you're not in good health. And that also comes back to the customer because to your point, right, we borrow a lot of money. We have over $6 billion in debt. But my, my weighted average cost of that uh, of borrowing is 3.85%. Who, who else can borrow a handful of billion dollars at that, that interest rate? That's incredible. We do that because we're healthy. So the consequence of not um, you know, being successful with this rate request is that the our doctor, right, the rating agencies in this metaphor, um, will potentially take downgrade us. And I think there's a high probability that if we're unsuccessful with this request, they'll look at not just CPS's um, metrics, but they're gonna look at our, our business model that we're so proud of, the owner regulator relationship. Um, and and that, I, that weighs about 25% of their rating. So, so, oh. so I'm, I'm gonna stop you there because what, what we just heard him say was, um, you know, the rating agency analysts will give us a downgrade in our score, and that's a, a severe consequence. And I guarantee you, there's a lot of people who just heard that and said, huh, what? what? What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, what it means is, you know, every percentage we pay is probably, you know, 80, 100 million dollars worth of additional uh, interest that goes back, not to stays here where we can, you know, invest in our system. It goes back to, you know, to, to bondholders New York. all over the place, yeah. you know, in New York, certainly, um, you know, in interest expenses. Um, so, so that's what the, you know, it, it which, you know, so that it, there's just less, you know, money to put back into our system, which is why we go out and, and we issue debt. You know, it's, it's like, the, it's the same. If you got a good credit rating, you get, you know, a three, a two and a half percent, you know, mortgage on your home. If you, if you don't have a great credit rating, then you're paying four five, six percent you know, on your home. And so that means it takes more out of your pocket every month. It's so, the same concept. So to, to keep it real simple, if we get downgraded by these rating agencies, we have to make tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars more in interest payments to people outside of San Antonio. And that money will never come back here. Well, and there's is that, one other, is that fair? Yes, sir. And there's one other impact. Yeah, that money, who else's, that money, who else's credit rating gets impacted? The city of San Antonio. The city of San Antonio. And if our credit rating gets yes, impacted sir. because you guys represent one third of our yes, revenue. Sir. If our credit rating gets impacted, that's less money for police, sidewalks, parks, streets, and that's catastrophic. It is. And, and so the way I think about that $5.10 we're talking about, that's money that at least stays here at home. And it's not going off to these places that you talked about. It's being reinvested here um, in our community. 
All right, guys, we're coming up to the end here. So I, I want to make sure to sort of speed round. Um, if this rate increase gets approved by city council, it will on average look like an extra $5 on the average bill. You, you get it, right? I mean, $5 for you and me and many people watching is, is a Starbucks coffee, right? $5 for other people who are watching though is medicine, right? Or having to make the choice between medicine and milk, uh, you know, and, or keeping, you know, uh, your kid in that extra, you know, tutoring class. Um, and you're proposing that we raise the rates on those folks as well. So here's the question. I, knowing that you're still asking for it and. You know, you understand that a lot of these folks are going to feel like you're piling on and that I'm piling on if I were to vote and support this onto their, um, the, their stressful economic situation. What do we say to those folks? Well, what we say to those folks is number 1, I mentioned all those programs that we have for okay. you that that I would, I would implore you to call us to give us an opportunity to help. Not only can we help you with utility assistance, we can help you with rental assistance. We can help you with, you know, pharmaceutical assistance. We can help you with food. We've right. got access to all the programs in the community. We work with over 200, you know, different, uh, uh, you know, organizations across the community. Um, but, but here's the other uh, thing, thing that's going to happen, Councilman. We'll be back. And guess what? The next time we come back to the city, it's probably going to be a higher uh, rate request every year that we kick the can down the road, you know, it is more and more uh, likely that the ask become bigger. So our, you know, where we're at today is that we reduced, you know, the increase from where we were with the, with the realization that we're going to try to come in for smaller increases to try to, you know, smooth those increases over time rather than have these one big, you know, uh, rate shocks, you know, that because we keep kicking the can down the road, look, Councilman, you own this asset. Your, you and your colleagues are in representation of your constituents, you own this asset. It's no different than owning a car and deciding, am I going to change the fuel in the car? I mean, the oil in the car, or am I not? And I'm, am I going to risk running that car into the ditch, you know, because the engine is burned down? You know, I mean, we're, you know, we're not asking, uh, and, and we know it's difficult to ask for $5.10 a month. We wouldn't be here. If we didn't think this ask was necessary, trust me, I am not, it is not fun standing in front of council, you know, on multiple sessions and answering the difficult questions that we're answering, but it has to be done. Yeah. And, and, and Corey, you know, I, I struggle with this um, because what you guys are asking the city council to do is to raise the rates on my mother-in-law. I mean, I, I mean, just to put it for you as, as simply as possible. Right? I have to look my mother in the law in the eye and tell her, this is why I raised your rates. Right? I have to raise the rates on my mother, um, who is the CEO of the Battered Women and Children's Shelter. I have to raise the rates. That's what you're asking me to do, to raise the rates on the Battered Women and Children's Shelter, to raise the rates on um, you know, local hospitals, to raise the rates on all the schools, to raise the rates on my kids, friends, parents. And it is an incredibly uncomfortable thing you're asking me to do and the complexity of it is really difficult to explain to folks out there who, who, you know, who aren't taking the time to listen to these presentations and watch. Um, and I think it's really important that we remind folks here in San Antonio that CPS Energy is a company run by San Antonians for San Antonio. So you're actually also saying we need to raise the rates on the employees of CPS because they pay full fare for their energy too, right? Um, I, I can't imagine how difficult <laughs> it is to to have to walk into a room and, and make that pitch. Nobody wants to make that pitch. Councilman, I've got my own mother-in-law and uh, my own, you know, I call my father-in-law suegro. I've got my own suegro, you know, lives two streets away from me. And I had to sit, you know, uh, in that, in the backyard over barbecue one day and explain to him why this was necessary. So I've got my own family members <laughs> in town that I have to have the same conversations with and every one of our employees is doing that with their own families. You know, it, nobody, you know, relishes the idea of having to ask for more revenue. You know, what I'm trying to do is make sure you understand, um, you know, what 
the need is, and that we put our 3,000 employees who, you know, risk their lives and put, you know, their families on the back burner when, when they got to come to work. Um, you know, we want to put them in a position to be successful, you know, and, and I don't want you to be in a position ever again. I hope not in the course of my career, at least whatever time I've got, you know, left with CPS Energy. And I want to make sure that you never get those calls, Councilman, uh, you know, with somebody who's been out of power for two or three days yeah. because we didn't make the investments we needed right now to ensure that never happens again. All right. Wrapping it up. How do people contact you fellas and your team if they have more questions after tonight? Uh, well, again, we uh, all of our energy advisors, you know, 210-353-2222, you know, can answer questions. I will tell you, if you have a direct question of me, all you have to do is email CEO at CPSenergy.com. And, I, you know, and I'm okay with my inbox getting flooded with questions. And I promise you, we will answer every one of them. So that's not a, that's not an empty promise, by the way. Um, uh, you and I both shared a moment, uh, you know, a few days ago. I, just anecdotally, I'll tell you, Corey, I was at a, I was at a barbecue with some friends and the, the topic of the CPS rate increase came up and everybody was quizzing me as to, you know, what I'm going to do. And I, I told them, I was like, I'm not going to make any decisions until I hear from everybody. But one of them said, well, my dad spoke to CEO Rudy Garza. And I said, he did. Um, how, how did that come about? He goes, he just called CPS, left a message. I need to speak to the CEO. And um, Rudy Garza called him. And I said, are you sure it was Rudy Garza that called him? I mean, that guy's running a multi-billion dollar organization. Surely it wasn't him. And I mentioned it to Rudy and Rudy was like, oh yeah, Bill Seabold. And I was like, it was Bill Seabold. You really called this man back and just let him give you a piece of your mind. And did you guys? Twice. Twice. <laughs> yes, sir. So the CEO, folks, he's not kidding. He really does call folks back. Please make sure to reach out to cpsenergy.com. Uh, where you can get a lot of good information. You can um, you reach them by way of that phone number. Social media, you're on every single one of them, except for Tinder. I, I, I don't know. I've, I've heard that. You, you know, that you yeah, my wife does. No, that's <laughs> not, that, not okay. Um, and then lastly, um, I'm going to let you make your closing argument, right? You, I'm going I'm to let you make your closing argument, and then what will happen after that is we'll say goodnight. Corey, if they have to remember one thing from our conversation tonight, what is it you want them to take away? I'm glad Rudy gets to go last, last. Oh, yeah. um, I would, I would want our customers to understand that we, we care about them because we live here. We work here. We play here. Um, we are part of the community and I want them to know that we feel and empathize and sympathize with everything that has gone on. And at the end of the day, we are here asking for, um, the bare bones investment into an asset that we all collectively share. And for the greater good, um, you know, this is this this great request is an investment to ensure that it continues to be strong in the future. Closing argument, sir. Well, what I would say is, you know, how CPS energy goes, so goes San Antonio. And uh, as Corey suggested, the 3000 employees at CPS energy, uh, including myself and, and all of our leadership team are committed to being the accountable. Uh, trusting, you know, organization that our community expects. Uh, CPS Energy has been loved by our customers in the years past, and you know what? We're going to get back to that. Uh, but, you know, my intention is to rebuild that trust one day at a time, one conversation at a time, uh, and to earn uh, the the confidence that the, the, the ask that we're making here uh, was well-placed, was uh, for, for those things we said we needed um, that you're going to see the results of, and 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 I'm going to be held accountable for that, and I and I and, and I expect to be. Um, so, Councilman, we're in this together. You know, the, you're guess what? As 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 part of our ownership of CPS Energy, you're part of the team too. And 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 what we're asking you for, you know, is is a recognition that that we got to do this together. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think we had a very robust conversation. I heard you. I I, I heard very frank answers to difficult questions. Uh, I heard a very healthy exchange of ideas. I heard acceptance uh, on the part of both of these gentlemen uh, of the message that they're hearing loud and clear from y'all. Um, I heard that they're open to hearing more from you. And tonight you gifted us with uh, your attention and your time, and you let us come to your homes uh, by way of, uh, of uh, video. Um, 
to, to have a serious conversation with you. And, and I hope that you got something out of this. I know I did. We'll be looking at every single comment going through it. And for my contact information, it is manny.talias at sanantonio.gov. Any and all emails are welcome. And uh, God bless you all. I hope that you all stay healthy and stay warm. And uh, please check in with city council meeting on Thursday, where we will be discussing and taking a vote on this very issue. Good night, folks.